This episode is brought to you by my signature group coaching program, Thrive from Stack to Unstoppable. Thrive from Stack to Unstoppable is a most comprehensive program for overcoming limiting beliefs so you can confidently take charge of your life and career. This newly updated program is the only step-by-step approach that holistically assesses your level of fulfillment and satisfaction in the key areas of your life. This is going to help you foster a bulletproof mindset so you can have clarity, let go of fear, and those memorized patterns that are keeping you stuck from being the person that you are created to be so you can be your most authentic self and build the confidence you need to succeed in your life and career. So to sign up for the next cohort of this group coaching program, all you need to do is go to www.wamboimboro.com forward slash thrive. And that is www.wambuimburu.com forward slash thrive. I can't wait to see you in class. The further along that I am now in my career, I always want to look back and see it takes me, I look back and I see younger professionals who are beginning their journey mm-hmm. and I feel a sense of calling to give them the support that I received from some great mentors, but also some support that I never received to fill in that gap so that I can help people, you know, avoid some of the mistakes that I made, mentor them and just be a guide and a resource to them or just a listening ear because sometimes people just want someone to listen Mm -hmm. um and so i've that's always been my mantra is to pay it forward to the next generation in whichever way possible in small ways in big ways um in my current organization outside that and retaining those lifelong i think partnerships um to see and for me what brings me the satisfaction is to actually see people succeed in their careers Mm -hmm. then i say i've made i've made a difference Hi, I am a boy in Baru, a corporate girl who also has multiple passions. When I'm not at my nine to five, I spend time focusing on growing my small side business that I love. I created from stack to unstoppable podcast to give you simple, actionable strategies to help you get unstuck from limiting beliefs and find your purpose. If you're a professional, a nine to fiver, or an aspiring entrepreneur, and are looking to get out of your comfort zone, use your God-given talents and passion, you, my friend, are in the right place. Let's get started. Welcome to another episode of From Stack to Unstoppable podcast. I am your host, Juan Boimboro. Today on the show, I'm excited to talk to the remarkable Nduko Malombe, Duko shares about how her diverse experiences working in both Kenya and America have uniquely shaped her leadership path. We talk about how she has been able to navigate the struggles of self-doubt and imposter syndrome as a leader. And we even talk about the difference between self-confidence and self-worth. And she gives us insights into how being our authentic self helps us uh, to stop comparing ourselves to others and to believe that we do have a place at the table. So I won't keep you waiting any longer. I'm excited for this conversation. So let's bring Duko in. Hi, Dan Duko. Thank you so much for being on my show. Thanks for the invite. I'm very, very honored to be here this morning. <laughs> Thank you. So for those who don't know you, um, please tell my listeners who you are and what you do. So my name is Nduku Malombe. I'm a proud Kenyan. Lived, uh, however, I am also an American citizen. I um, I live in the Washington, D.C. area, and I've been a professional in the human resources field for a little close to 20 years now. So that's a little bit about my general background. Awesome. 20 years. That's yes. amazing. That's a long journey. And I know your journey into leadership, you been in leadership roles, how have these leadership roles in diverse backgrounds affected um, your impact into the HR HR world? So, yes, I've worked for like a wide range of organizations, starting first in Kenya, and then I moved here to the United States. So I was able to 
day, you know, learn about the local context, being a Kenya, working in Kenya and understanding the nuances of working in that context. When I transitioned to do, even though at that time I was working for a global a nonprofit, a number of nonprofits that I worked with before I came to the US, I think transitioning to this side of the world opened me up to several like more diverse, uh, I can call them diverse experiences. One, it was a cultural change for me. So understanding who I am outside of my normal skin, which was in Africa with Africans. And now I was in a new territory as a foreigner, an African trying to find my space amongst Americans, but also my fellow uh, people from other, <clears throat> other walks of life that have made America their home. So for me, I think from a personal level, it was finding my, my footing mm -hmm. in order to then understand how do I start to make impact in my community, in the work that I did, but also not to forget that one of the main reasons that drove me to embark on this journey to come overseas was also to be able to make connections with the, with my homeland, Kenya. So continuing working in that nonprofit mission driven work with a diverse you know, diverse missions, working with a diverse people from diverse walks of life and backgrounds, but still tying it to that mission driven impact that I've always desired to remain in for the longest in my career. And over time, you get to see that that's sort of the place that I've remained grounded. That's how I feel like the diversity of experiences has shaped me so yes. that I'm able to bring something to the table, learn something new. Um, impact me personally as a human being, but also for me to show up and make a difference where, wherever I've worked over those 20 some years. Wow, that's amazing. And now coming from Kenya into America, you know, those are very differ diverse cultures. How was it transitioning from Kenya into America and into these uh, corporate roles that you're in? Ah, uh, it was an interesting experience. I will say one of my very first jobs out of college, I was um on my OPT and I was a manager. <laughs> and I did everything that everyone who is not familiar with the American corporate sector, I did everything wrong. I was working in a union environment and I did not realize, and I lived in Michigan at that time, that Michigan is a highly unionized um, state. That's why many, many businesses stay away from being in Michigan, but I was working for a unionized uh, company and I did not know much about unions yeah, and the power of unions. And so I kind of made like those rookie mistakes around HR when it came to personnel issues. And a couple of times I would get summoned by the union rep and he would, you know, tell me, you can't do that. And I was like, what do you mean? I can't do that. I mean, Logically, it made sense to me, but I did not understand the, the nuances of working in a union. So I, for me, I, I think I learned by, you know, experience. I made mistakes because I did not understand how the American system worked, how the laws worked here. There were federal laws. There were state, state laws. I actually did not study HR, so I knew nothing. I really was winging this by using my intuition and logic. That was it. Wow, your intuition and logic. So then you did you go further and study HR or how did you transition? Well, surprisingly, I did not study HR. Mm -hmm. My background was in marketing. I majored in uh, business and then, and then I had an MBA. I will say I didn't find HR. HR found me. Nice. How, how is that? Tell us. <laughs> I always knew that that I wanted to do something that makes a uh, connect me with people. Mm -hmm. And that's why I ended up majoring in marketing at that time. You know, I, could, I did not know much about HR. I didn't feel in Kenya, the HR sector felt very industrial, very cold. And mm -hmm. so I never found myself gravitating to that people side of the career. So I was like, oh, marketing, talking to people. Okay. I, I think this is my groove here. But later on, realizing that I would accidentally fall into HR and then it would become my, my one true love. 
So that's that, and and so most of what I have learned over my career, I've learned by doing. Wow. I've learned by being mentored um, by some very strong HR people uh, who I still look up to this day. People who took a chance on me, people who believed me, uh, believed in me, and um, had play, played a very instrumental role in my career as my teachers and my coaches. Um, and and then obviously some of that I paired it with my own uh, formative education. So you know, taking the standard HR certifications just to round out that experience with sort of that technical know-how yeah. or the methodology and the science behind that. So that continued education, I think further up in my career, I have continued to do that to just anchor myself more with the, with you know best practices and things like that. That's amazing. I too came to do marketing from Kenya. I, oh. never thought I would end up in the in HR in the HR world, which I really love. So that's yeah. it's like we have two this you know something common in common here. Yeah. yeah. So now the other thing is that I know that you're involved with uh, in the HR community and you advocate for women. What led to this? What inspires you to advocate for women? I think for me, I I call it like paying forward. The further along that I am now in my career, I always want to look back and see. It takes me, I look back and I see younger professionals who are beginning their journey. Mm -hmm. And I feel a sense of calling to give them the support that I received from some great mentors, but also some support that I never received to fill in that gap so that I can help people, you know, avoid some of the mistakes that I made, mentor them and just be a guide and a resource to them or just a listening ear because sometimes people just want someone to listen. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've, that's always been my mantra is to pay it forward to the next generation in whichever way possible, in small ways, in big ways, um, in my current organization, outside that and retaining those lifelong i think partnerships um to see as for me what brings me the satisfaction is to actually see people succeed in their careers then i say i've made i've made a difference that's awesome now yeah. imposter syndrome let's speak about that in leadership it's a big struggle and you are in one of you know i think you're right now in your career in one of the highest role of an hr so have you ever struggled with imposter syndrome and how did you navigate it? Thousand percent, a thousand percent. Mm -hmm. if, you talk, if you talk to my husband, he will tell you how that's sort of played. It played a lot of center stage over my career. And I think at some point in your career, you get to that place where you freeze. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are, you, you, it's, you're in that freeze flight mode because you're unsure of who you are. You don't see your value. You measure your value by comparing yourself to others. Yes. You know, you look at your peers and they're very credentialed. And you look at yourself and you say, I don't even have a human resources degree. I, you know, I'm not moving up as fast in my career as I would like to. Mufa. So you, that, you know, comparison is the thief of joy. Yes. And that's when that you start to sort of not see your value. Um, and then you start to look for ways to seek validation from others. And so for me, the imposter syndrome was, um, I think, one of my biggest blind spots in my career. It literally like froze me. I got stuck oh, wow. in my career. I became like, an, you know, analysis paralysis, like what am I doing wrong? And, you know, or if I'm interviewing for a position, I over prepare because I'm like, I have to prove myself. I have to show, I have to use eloquent words. I have to write these, like, you know, my husband be like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> what is all these pieces that you're writing for an interview? And sometimes okay. I found, over time, I found that was not necessary. It's like, yeah. No, be true to yourself and who you are and the right people will see you. Right. And so it's sort of been an, an unlearning journey for me because I did not have the self-confidence out the gate to mm -hmm. believe that I was worthy of the calling to do the things that I do. 
naturally I am an introvert. I'm very quiet. Mm -hmm. I'm in a, in a role that's sort of expected to be very, you know, you're the face, you're the people face. So people sometimes assume that you are the most vocal, you're the most eloquent, you're the, you know, you're the people person, you're the people charmers and all that kind of thing. So it was very, you know, I wasn't sure. And then when I came across Susan King's book on quiet leadership, I was like, this is it. This is the type of leader. I then realized I don't have to be the loudest voice in the room. Right. I need to leverage my strengths. My strengths are I'm very reflective, very analytical, insightful. Um, I'm very, you may see me quiet, but when I speak, yeah. I speak, I speak wisdom, right? Yes. And so sometimes I'll speak and people will be like, oh, wow. That was, did she say that? <laughs> did she say that? And like, that was so profound, you know? And so over time, you start to be your own cheerleader. You get yourself out of that imposter syndrome by being your own cheerleader. Yeah, because you get a rah, rah, rah for yourself. You're like, I know I can do this. I didn't bribe my way into this job. They saw something in me. So yeah. why is it that I'm questioning myself? I have the chops to do the thing. Right. And so over time, you have to be selfish and say, you know what? I'm good. I know I'm great. Yes. Yeah. And there's one funny time during an interview. <laughs> cannot believe this. I say this. They ask me, why should we hire you? Okay. And I say, because I am the best that I know. Oh, wow. And that, that, sealed, and that sealed the deal. I would hire you if you told me that. <laughs> That's a lot of confidence there. <laughs> You know, I went away and I said, wow, that took a lot of guts. That was, yes. you know, that was. And from that moment on, I started to see myself in a very different, in a very different uh, light mm -hmm. and became more comfortable in my skin. Yes. Um, yeah. So when I show up in places, I just show up as I am. I speak as I do. I have, I, I recognize that I'm not great at everything and I'm okay with that. It's normal. Nobody's perfect, right? And then I don't compare myself to other people. I actually see their strengths, celebrate their strengths, and find ways we can sort of, I can learn from others and how we can be complementary because sometimes it's just, it just is what it is. It's not about you needing to learn a new skill. You just, you are just who you are and that's okay. That's okay. You are just who you are and that's okay. That yeah. is so profound that you say that, uh, it, you know, you don't compare yourself because a lot of people compare themselves. And that's like this, you said, a comparison, the thief of joy. And just yeah. really that self-awareness. I don't know everything. And so I'm okay. I'm okay yes. with who I am. And, yeah. I talk, and I know you had talked about self-confidence. Now, what is the difference between self-confidence and self-worth? Because uh, I've, I've worked with many people who, many professionals who have a lot of self-confidence. Sometimes they don't have that self-worth to go to the next level of their career because they're not believing in themselves. So to you, what would, how do you describe self-confidence and the self-worth, the difference? I find like there's a difference. Yeah, I, I think of the curve self-confidence, I think uh, is more external facing. Yes. And self-worth is more inside. Like for me, my self-worth is I, I take stock of all my experiences. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I it's like about my internal bank account. Yeah. yeah. And I see that my self-worth is, my value is growing within me internally. And then what that yields is the self-confidence. Mm -hmm. It pairs with the self-confidence that, because I know that I'm worthy, then mm -hmm. I can walk. I can walk out confidently, knowing that what I'm about to say or what I'm about to do yes. is is great work. For example, yeah? yeah. So I think sometimes many people start with self confidence as a coping mechanism because they don't want to deal with the internal things, right? Yes. So they come off as very super confident, and we I know this, and I know my you know, I know my craft really, really well, but that's just a projection of some internal self-worth things that you haven't dealt with. Mm -hmm. And so later on, I think when you, when you start to see that um, happen is 
further along in your career where you find you've been so external facing that you're burnt out, that yeah. you have to regroup and start to work on your self-worth and realize that you don't have to show up every time by just being this, like, I produce a thousand percent. No, sometimes being still and just saying, you know what, my self-worth is that I know what I bring to the table. I know when I need to be, I, I want to be quiet. I'm going through a season where I'm more reflective and it's okay. It doesn't change who I am and the confidence of what I bring to the table. So that's how I think I would look at it. But I also do think that sometimes one can one can connect can connect to the other. Right. I, I like the way you 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 say it. It's self confidence exter is external. You know yeah. the way you know just that confidence of I'm good at my skills and the self worth is internal and knowing that knowing that I am worthy just the way I am. Just yeah. the way I am. It doesn't matter whether I have a degree or not. You know, as long as I, you know, I I know and I believe in myself and I'm worthy for this position. You know, yeah. yeah. The way you you describe it and you talked about burnout. Now tell me about how do you you know have you ever been burned out in your career and how do you handle it and how would you advise people who you know it's going 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 and then they end up being burned out what. What are the strategies or tips that you can give my listeners? Burnout is like the order of day, I think, for many, especially leaders. I'm not discounting non-leaders, but I will say especially for leaders, because for me, it's a real example where I've felt that I'm carrying the shoulders of being a leader mm -hmm. uh, of the organization. So I, I have that responsibility to the commitments that I've made in within my, my space, HR, but also as a leader of the organization. And so what you end up doing is you sort of put this invisible burden upon yourself mm -hmm. and uh, perfection becomes the enemy of progress, right? Okay. So you want to do so much good. You want to bring so much change. You want to have so much impact. And so you're just going, 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 going. And so for me, what happened is, especially when we moved into the uh, pandemic, uh, when we were in quarantine, COVID pandemic, uh, sitting at home, uh, in front of a computer, doing a lot of things with the pandemic, a lot of HR things changed, people think things changed. So we had to pivot and we were just doing a lot of things and we were just taking on that burden. And then without realizing it, Towards the tail end of the pandemic, I became, it manifested into physical symptoms for me. Mm -hmm. My body was shutting down. My brain was just foggy. Mm -hmm. I was having a hard time even keeping my routine things that give me balance, like fitness, you know? And I just felt like I was just dragging myself because I was like, I'm committed. I want to get it done. I want to get it done. I committed to get it done. But what I didn't realize is, you know, in a career like HR, we give so much, yeah. but we receive very little. Yeah, our, our roles, we are nurturers, we're givers, we give yeah. to, we take care of people. So we never pour into ourselves. Right. And so for me, one of the key things to address burnout was beginning to realize I'm a to see myself as that I'm a human being as well, mm -hmm. I also need to pour into myself right. so that if I if I want to be able to have the capacity to pour onto others, I have to make sure that my I have that um, I'm okay, I'm healthy in all in all forms yeah. of health, yeah, my well being and things like that. And yeah. so I had to I had to make intentional decisions to prioritize my mental health. Good. Yeah, just like, you know, ma many people yeah. um, and really um, start to set goals around mental health mm -hmm. and start to do it in small incremental ways. If you wait for like that major time or one week or take a vacation, it's never going to happen. Yeah. So yes. mindfulness, taking breaks in between the day, doing deep breathing exercises, you don't realize like that five minutes right. recalibrates and rewires, you know, studies have shown it just recalibrates and rewires your brain, you know, 
taking short walks, yes. finding spaces to, I'm a laugher. I don't know if you, if you meet a few, few people <laughs> that I've worked with, they say that I really laugh from the belly and oh, that's yeah. a really good relief. So I miss having, being able to just laugh for no reason. I just laugh as part of my normal day. So yeah. I look for humor every day. Yes. I'm very intentional. And so when I laugh with my colleagues, I'm like, okay, that was my humor for the day. So it's finding joy in those in those moments. Yeah. Um, and really, my husband's taught me a really good thing is that we have so many business going on in our lives, work, home, you know, school, extracurricular activities. Sometimes you just have to be present, be where your feet are at that moment and tune out all these other things and be intentional about that. And I think you start to reel the, re- the ROI on seeing that that graph on burnout slowly go down. Right. And then you also know when when the triggers happen and then you can you can self-manage that. Right. Yes. Yeah. I love that uh, the, about the self-care. At my uh, my team at work, we have breaks every single day where we take self-care walk and we walk around the building. It's so I, I know about um, you know burnout and what it can what it can cause, and so those small shifts, like you're saying, and being intentional, and just on your calendar saying, okay, it's time to, you know, stand up or stretch, take a walk, uh, mindfulness, all these things. I think the pandemic brought a lot of awareness to to people, and especially in the area of mindfulness, uh, because yeah. there was a lot of burnout there, even just. Being in the house, a lot of not only not necessarily burnout, but that loneliness, and so you know, being able to uh, create some time for your mental health is so important. I'm glad that we are talking about this. Yeah, one thing I wanted to add is also establishing boundaries. You know, you know, cu- culturally, we are not raised that way, right? You say no. So, yeah, so it's it's a kind of like a. Oh, I, I don't know. What do you mean boundaries? I mean, you, 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 we come from cultures where you just do as you're told. No, there's no, you can't push back or you can't say, set, you know, so for me, it was very important to exercise setting healthy boundaries okay. and saying, you know, managing expectations, you know, even at work, you say, so when do you need this guy? And then, you know, teaching people to understand prioritization, yes. people respecting that there's, you know, I will commit to do it, but these are the boundaries within which we're going to do it. Yeah. I'm an inca- and, and really largely for me, because I manage a team, is to lead by example. Yes. Really so like when that. I, you know, seeing people working weekends, I say, you know, I, I'm like, no, that's, you know, that's you develop bad habits because then you don't have time for you. Or if you do that and people, res- they'll set an expect you set the expectation that people can contact you on weekends. And, you know, that's, so you get, you know, you sort of s- stuck in that cycle. So yes. healthy boundaries are healthy. They're okay. very healthy. Yeah, yeah. Because I think culturally, we've never been raised that way. So approaching boundaries, we, we you know, we tend to be timid about it. You're like, oh, I don't know what they're going to say. They'll think that I'm refusing to do my job or what, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like the boundary part of it. Well, I'm a recovering people pleaser, so I understand that <laughs> saying no. That was never a language that we spoke, you know, where yeah. was really, it's like, okay, you do it, you please someone. Yeah, yes, I can do that. Yeah. And eventually yeah. you're being burned out. Yes. Yeah. Because you you have so much on your plate and you committed so much, it's it just becomes too too much. So those those type of things, you know, saying no, I would love to help you, but maybe Susie can help you, you know, exactly. not today. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Yes. I'm loving this conversation. Um, so now, what can you tell my listeners about leadership in terms of? I know a lot of, like I said, I work with people who shy away from even taking leadership roles. Um, because uh, they don't believe in themselves. And I know we talked about imposter syndrome, but what can you uh, encourage someone to step up, you know, step out of their comfort zone and go take a leadership role or, and, and you know, any a, a role that will t- remove them from where they are to something else? Yeah. 
I think people need to understand that they need to break away from the stereotypes of what a leader is. Anyone is capable of being a leader. For me, my biggest learning is if I look back to when I was a child, I never envisioned myself being a leader ever. I just thought I was going to get a job. And, and, you know, and even in the earlier parts of my career, I started at the most entry level of HR, entry level. Wow. Yeah. And this is after coming to America. So when I'm a grown adult, yes. yeah, I'm not, you know, and I just started my career at the entry level, but I believed in myself and people saw something in me. Find you a mentor. If you find a good mentor along your journey, I think they also help you step out of, they get you to see yourself differently, right? Because right. sometimes you, you're in your head shutting yourself down and saying, no, you're not good enough. No, you cannot be a leader. No. And then one of the things I say is, um, in hindsight, reading, just read, read books, just right. read books. Even if it's not a full book, just start to read. Because I think the knowledge you acquire over time begins to shape your mindset, right? Like growth mindset, right? You know, make mistakes, learn from those mistakes, grow as long as you're open to learning and trying and taking risks then you can step into leadership. So, so reading books, listening to podcasts, mm -hmm. uh, you know, networking, it doesn't matter how. If you see somebody that you admire that's a leader, send them a message and say, hey, I just want to know, like I've had people reach out to me because they've seen me post on social media about who I am and what I do. And they are interested in following a similar track. And I'm just like, please, I welcome you to my space, you know, grab a chair, let's talk, let's have coffee, let's have a virtual chat. How can I be of service to you? I want people to really step into step into their full potential and we are all leaders. Leader is not a title. Right. Yeah. So I always challenge even my colleagues at work, even the most entry level. And I say, you're a leader. You know, I look to your leadership on that project. And sometimes, you know, a, a, a new hire entry will look at me puzzled, like, I said, yeah, and I'm like, it's leadership is not a title. Right. Yeah. And anyone has the capacity to lead. If you give them the chance, if you guide them, you know, and they demonstrate the potential, why not? Yeah. Why not? Why not? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. And, and yeah. Duko, I reached out to you after I saw you posting on uh, Kwitu, the Kenyan <laughs> uh, women in uh, the USA group. And, yeah. you you know, so I, uh, I thought, wait a minute, she's in HR. And I called you and we started talking and here we are, we are friends. Yeah. It's been, I, I think it's been like two years or something or one and a half years. And yeah. Yeah, so I do believe, you know, you're, you're I'm a true testament to what you're saying. <laughs> Reach out to me. And I will share with you the knowledge that I have. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. so, so grateful to uh, to have met you. And uh, we've been having very good conversations. And yeah, I've drawn a lot from you. Just from seeing you, identifying with you, and also just your your strength, um, your strong leadership um, uh, skills. So I am so honored to 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 know you. So anything uh, else you would like to talk to my, uh, to tell my followers, my, my audience, anything else, any tips? Um, I think just be, I just encourage people to, to really be their authentic self. Mm -hmm. I think many of us try to be things that we are not because we are trying to get in the door. When I mean get in the door, it's both metaphorically and physically. You want to get into the, you know, get in the door, the door to be accepted, you know, whatever it may be, or you want to get in the door to get that job or to get to move up that ladder. I, I, I always tell people, be who you want to be. Your journey may not take a linear path, but when things fall into place the way that they're supposed to fall into place, you will look back and understand why things went the way they went. And never compare your story to another person's story. We are where we are 
by divine design. It's not by accident. And so, you know, keep going, build that resilience. Like for me, resilience is has been a huge player in grounding me in who I am. I never gave up. I never quit. I mean, I know, you know, I could talk for days about my, my life story. I was selling stationery. What? That's how how much I was committed to my career and journey to make it in America. And I was sell I, I literally showed up to a job to sell stationery. In, in America or in Kenya? America. Oh and my gosh, I, I want to hear that. I quickly turn around after 24 hours in the job. I said, that was not cut for me. And I calmed the Washington Post newspaper. And I said, I'm going to find another job. I know I'm here for a reason. And I know that I, I was not made to fail. So I combed through the Washington Post, found this very small classified ad for a small African um, international global nonprofit. I applied and I made, I made the classic, you know, uh, re, uh, candidate mistakes, which is I called the hiring team because I was that committed. I was that like, I'm not going to quit. I'm not. And I said, I know we're not supposed to call but I really, really want this job. And the hiring manager, God bless her heart, mm -hmm. um, something about what I said or how I talked or what I said and my resume, my scanty resume said, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to take a chance on you. So I've taken it as a mantra to take a chance on people. So I wish people would not gloss over just people at face value. Take a chance, get to know people. Yes. You'll be greatly surprised at how much that decision you make could change, literally change somebody's life. Yes. And that for me, I think is so important. And so I cultivate relationships with people in a very intentional way because I don't know that I could say something or do something that changes somebody's life forever and makes an impact in a way that I didn't know that it would make an impact. So we have to take the time to really like build our human relationships and how we, you know, we we are now in a point of privilege, those of us who are in America, where we really have the opportunity to give back. Yes. To not only here, but even people back home. Back so home. let's do let's do that, right? Sometimes we sit in our we sit in our spaces in our bubbles mm -hmm. and we Never take this, and this is these are things that don't cost money. They don't cost yeah. money. No. Nothing, yeah. And the time that you could be spending, you know, scrolling social scrolling. media, get you know, get on a call and talk to someone. It doesn't even have to be in a career and field that yeah. you're in. Just people are looking for that wisdom, right. and we have so much to give. Otherwise, what? Why did we build this stock? in of, over 20 years of experience it's so that we can pour it into others so yeah. i you know there's just so many lessons i can share so many anecdotes or things yeah um but you know i'm i think i'm i feel i have so much more to give and that's what i'm going, going to continue you know as we move through different seasons in our careers right. for those of us who sort of hit the pinnacle of our career the outlook for me is really giving back and spending my time just giving back in whichever way or form that shows up at my doorstep. I love that. Oh, wow. Look at that. Is, you're making such an impact. And, uh, <laughs> yes, you are. Really, you are. Yeah. And, you. And, and this person who gave you a chance, look at the, did you even, you had no idea this is where you would end up, right? Oh, and the funny thing is, yeah. Uh, about a year ago, she reached out to me and she was looking for a job. And she, I think she asked if I could link her up with someone. I mean, I'm talking about somebody who was at a more senior level than I was. She was a vice president at the time she had, and, you know, had a very prolific career. And she remembered me and she came to me and she was like, hey, I'm in the market. I'm looking for a job. You know, if you hear anything, put a good word in for me. And I was like, what? what? Me? Little tiny me, your little project. Yes. And I always remind her, though our you know life's taken us in different directions. Mm -hmm. I periodically remind her that she is one of the most people who've made the most instrumental 
impact in my life. Mm -hmm. And I said, absolutely, whatever I can do. Yeah. I took that up to this day. I still feel like I owe her one. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. That's a full moment, you know, 360 moment there. Yeah. And she helped you. And here you are now helping her. Yeah. It comes yes. back to you. I'm, yes. I'm so happy about this conversation. So where can people find you in Duco? So they can find me on LinkedIn. If you just search my name, Duko Malombe. And then I've, I just recently launched a consulting um, consulting initiative called Synergy HR. I will update my, my web okay. page on my LinkedIn. Okay. Um, again, this is part of my mission to give back and to give back to businesses and to partner with thought leaders like you and others in the community to bring that change that we want to see both in our communities here and in Africa. Yes. And so I'm looking forward to that next chapter of that, that work. And as always, my doors open, no matter what, no matter what people want to reach out to me for. I welcome, I welcome that. Um, as you can hear, I am a, I'm a talk. I'm not a, a much of a talker. I do talk. <laughs> I do like to talk, yeah. uh, but I also do like to listen. So I, I really am fascinated about learning about people's stories and how I can, you know, we can take that conversation and help them get to their next uh, step in their, in their own journeys. <laughs> uh, amazing. Awesome. I'm going to link your uh social me media handles in um, in my show notes and i uh, would love for people to reach out to you yes reach out to nduko she is she keeps her word you reach out to her she will reach back to you because she did with me and here we are we've had a yeah, actually did. Who knew? <laughs> like like rewind back to a year and a half or whatever who knew we'd be like sitting here talking to each other or even just having you know just periodic conversations about you know, when I talk about that thought leadership, like, hey, what do you think about this? And yes. what's going on? And we just find something. Right. It just morphs into this beautiful dialogue. Conversations. I mean, who, who would have known that? Who would have known? So, <laughs> so that's, I, I'm just so happy that uh, I'm able to connect with you and be a friend. I can call you a friend. So thank, thank you so you. much for being on my show. I really appreciate this conversation. And I'm thank going you. to have you back. Because I know I'm you're going looking to... forward to that. I yes, I want to have you back, and you can tell us more about um, the consultancy. Um, you know how that's going, and if you want to share about that too, that would be good. But I want to yes. have you back, and uh, definitely, yeah. definitely. Thank you for giving us a platform um, to do. You know, to to share with the world. Um, I think you. I think you are transforming. Um, in a way that you don't realize that you're giving a lot of people a voice. And I really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. That's a, such a kind, those are kind words to say. Thank you, Nduko. Of course, anytime. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Leave a comment below and let us know what your takeaway was. And until next time, take care. Hey, if you enjoyed today's episode, please take time to review and rate it. It's the fastest and easiest way to say thank you for creating this content. Until next time, keep thriving. I cannot wait to see you next week. Take care now.